On today's World Insight, Shanghai relaxes COVID control measures. We look at how China will stimulate its economy after recovering from its latest bout of COVID. Hello, I'm Tian Wei, and welcome to World Insight. Shanghai on Wednesday lifted its strictest COVID-19 measures from the past two months. The city is entering a new phase of orderly reopening and economic recovery. Not only Shanghai, but the whole country is gradually getting back to some degrees of normality from the setbacks caused by the recent COVID-19 outbreak. This week, China's State Council issued detailed policies that are likely to further stabilize the economy at the local level. The package includes 33 measures covering fiscal and financial policies in areas such as investment, consumption, food and energy security, industrial and supply chains, as well as people's livelihoods. So how to interpret this new policy package and what's next for the Chinese economic recovery? Let's ask our panelists. For more on the latest with the Chinese economy in Shanghai, Wang Dan, Chief Economist of Hang Sang Bank China, and Bert Hoffman, Director of the East Asian Institute at National University of Singapore, former Country Director for China of the World Bank. In Beijing, Xu Qiang, Assistant Director from the International Monetary Institute from Renmin University of China. Dan, congratulations, you are based in Shanghai. I know you've been riding bikes around the city. Did you have fun? Uh, yes, I certainly did. Um, and in a way, I thought it was better biking uh, during the lockdown because yeah. there were more people. Now everybody's getting out celebrating the release. So it's getting a bit harder. Well, you know, there's always two sides of the same coin, isn't it? And then Professor Chu Qiang, Beijing, what about the situation there? It seems that your hair is getting longer. Oh yes, Beijing is on the way of recovery, uh, but still uh, we cannot uh, eat inside of the restaurant and also the barber shop is not open yet. But I think we've been controlling the pandemic uh, pretty well. So I think uh, hopefully we can see the silver lining in the next week. It seems that more confidence uh, in the city of Beijing. And Bird, where are you? How are you doing? Well, we're in Singapore and there things are practically back to normal. For those people that are fully vaccinated, basically everything is, uh, is possible, travel is possible, and uh, yeah, the restaurants are open. It's, it's, it's pretty much back to normal also. It seems that many Asian cities, China's included, are on the way back. But what does that mean uh, for Asia Pacific? Uh, this place is uh, very much uh, the growth engine, as you say, of the world economy. Uh, Dan, what is your take? Well, it is quite important that things get back to normal as soon as possible. And now uh, it will, it's pretty clear that it will take a while before the consumer confidence and investors' confidence be restored. And the government has come up with a lot of measures, but there's still uncertainty that COVID might come back. So mm. we are waiting for more signals that if in the future, the lockdown measures could be done in a different way. So uh, activities in production will not be stopped. Right now, Chinese government has been issuing uh, lots of uh, policies to try to help uh, the enterprises and households. So uh, we've been looking at uh, there are rent uh, rebut from the uh, uh, lots of the uh, property management, and also we've been seeing the low interest rate loan uh, been providing to the SMEs, and also we've been seeing the tax free policies uh, for the small shops and restaurant. Uh, so I think the government is really providing what they, whatever they can do to help uh, the small players on the market. They've been pushing forward the policies of delaying the mortgage payment for the household. And uh, I think with all these incentives uh, from the central government, uh, very hopefully the economy is going to recover uh, from the low point. Yeah, but it usually takes about two to three weeks for things to go back somewhat to normal. So what do you make of this transition period? Are the policies sufficient? So I'm afraid the current policies are not sufficient to restore the demand in especially catering um, because 
the main uh, requirement now is the 72 hour uh, COVID test. And you already see the lineup in every single PCR test spot. And I'm afraid in two to three weeks, people are still trying to avoid um, to uh, get into the public places, including the restaurants. So the government really need to either relax the requirement for the PCR test or come up with a different scheme. Um, mm. I think it will be easy. So moving into the vaccination, making sure that everybody's vaccinated is very, very important for, for, for any future eventuality. Second, uh, I mean, the government gave a very strong signal with uh, the 33 points. Uh, I, I do think that, that it requires a pretty big boost to maintain the target of the 5.5%. And I think we're not yet quite there. Maybe that target is now a bit relaxed after, uh, after disruptions from the, uh, from the recent uh, months. Uh, but, but I think the government can do more in terms of stimulus if it wants to keep a relatively high growth rate. There is no language from the top leadership yet about abandoning the 5.5% target. And that means in the first half of the year, the growth has to be reasonable. And we have already lost April and May. And what that means is in June, there has to be a very strong rebound. Uh, in Shanghai, I have no doubt that the rebound in consumption and somewhat in infrastructure spending and uh, in manufacturing will be very strong, but property market is weak. So nationwide, I'm afraid, probably in June, we'll see around two to 3% of growth. Would it be enough to negate the loss in the previous two months? Uh, that is questionable. Whether some of the earlier tools, for example, about the propping up the property markets will be used uh, once again to uh, make sure growth happens in the extent that a planned. So what do you make of the earlier tools? Uh, what do you think are the most efficient tools for now? So I think urbanization and the uh, property market are combined together. And the whole uh, market really right now is considering lower than interest rate. If you consider China, it's still above uh, the 4%. This is very high all over the world. So I think in China, we still have a very large leeway uh, to uh, lower down the interest rate to prop up uh, the whole market. And also, I think the government right now are doing a lot of things to try to support people's confidence in this regard. For example, right now, if you look at Beijing, they've been pushing forward one policy, that is all the properties right now around uh, the top middle school uh, or elementary right now have equal right to get access into that school. So I think all these signals are showing the government is really trying to rebuild people's confidence. Uh, the property market is probably going to stay very weak if uh, the government doesn't relax the three red line requirements um, because ever since the last year, the expectation for the market has been reversed and people are hesitant to buy new housing and the companies are hesitant to rent new commercial office space. And this year after Shanghai lockdown, this trend is very significant now. Uh, remote working is so prominent and a lot of companies are talking about uh, renting a smaller space and that would be quite devastating if that could become the reality. And in Shanghai's 33 measures, it doesn't mention anything about propping up the property market in a significant mm -hmm. way. So there has to be more. Yeah. And what do you think are the most efficient tools we have? I mean, China has. Uh, the most efficient tool to me is monetary expansion. Uh, cutting interest rate would be very effective once all the lockdown measures are truly lifted. Uh, if they are still in place, then monetary expansion wouldn't work. I'm a bit more skeptical of the monetary side for reasons of, of I think the constraint right now is confidence and demand. And, and then lowering your interest rate really doesn't help that much. In addition, there are these measures of, of, on, on the real estate, but overall the government actually wants to move away from excess leverage. And so uh, even though that may not be applicable this year, by next year it may be back. And you see the hesitation with local governments to take on extra debt. You see the hesitation to spend. And I think that comes from, from, from that concern. Also, local governments have uh, uh, really uh, gone down in revenues. So they are worried about whether they can actually pay the bill next, uh, next year and the year after. So one of the measures that, that the government can do is really to boost uh, their transfers to local governments so that the local governments have more money to spend on the right thing. 
Second, I'm very much with uh, Chu Chang on the urbanization. One of the great measures in the package is uh, more water supply. And, and that's a, that's really is a bottleneck to a lot of the urbanization that is that is uh, happening in, in China. Mm. Uh, but giving more central financing for that would be very helpful. I think one, one can do more if and when needed. I mean, I don't see all the numbers, but if and when needed, it, 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 there is more, there's more boosting to be done. The most recent numbers though are a little bit more uh, optimistic. The MBS just released the uh, PMI numbers, uh, yeah. uh, uh, which is a measure of confidence in industry and in, in services. And they have seen a bounce back from April in May. So, so uh, there's, there's a little bit of, of light at the end of the tunnel. Small and medium-sized companies, despite of the latest policies coming from central and local government, are going to suffer for quite some time, uh, given what happened recently. So um, what do you make of the fate of these factor of the overall Chinese economy? Well, the small, smaller firms in China have always had a problem in uh, borrowing. And in the past two months, you just can see the draining of liquidity uh, for a lot of them slowly. And now many of the measures coming out are trying to target this issue by cutting fees, taxes, and providing extended loans from commercial banks. Um, these are very necessary. Um, but just like Bert said, uh, demand recovery is the ultimate solution. And now uh, there is no good way to encourage people to spend um, because China is very different. It doesn't have the kind of cash handout from the government like uh, a lot of West countries did. So there is no such financial cushion for people to spend. Uh, I know there's uh, uh, the systematic reason why the government is reluctant to just give out cash because it's like a one-time booster. But in this very urgent time, this one-time booster could work a lot better than cutting taxes, in my opinion. Oh, yes, I agree with Dan. Uh, that is, I think the cash relief is really, really uh Urgent. I think um, for most of the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, really right now, after they're paying the uh, the rent, uh, after paying the salary of their employees, uh, they do need some cash in their hand. Uh, but of course, we understand. Uh, we also explain to the people that why China is reluctant to uh, release the cash because you cannot control the uh, multipliers. Or for example, right uh, in the before, if you issue 100 yuan from central bank, uh, they're probably going to circulate for several times. So, for example, I give Don uh, 100 yuan for the services, and Don give Bert for the product, and the Bert give you for the rent, and uh, the circulate for four times, but only with 100 yuan of each ones. But right now, if we're in emergency and they will issue 400 yuan to each of us, and then uh, we're going to see huge inflation is coming out. So that is probably the problem that the central government is going to worry about. But I agree totally with Don that it's, it's an urgent situation. So sometimes you need uh, the urgent medicines for the uh, for the cure. So yes, I think uh, plus uh, the tax-free policies and plus the low interest rate loans, and also you need to circ uh, to some extent you need the cash. Bert, briefly. Well, so uh, in addition to that, I, I do think it is very good that the government pays a lot of attention to restoring the supply chains, where a lot of SMEs are actually linked into that. So paying big attention to that, making sure that the COVID measures are compliant with, with of course, the health concerns, but also with the economic concerns is very important. I was also encouraged by this, the, the stated support for the platform companies. A lot of small and medium enterprises use the platform companies as their market. So more support for them actually helps small and medium enterprises as well. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too, by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei, go beyond the headlines. 
about inflation, that's a global issue. We see what's going on in the United States. Uh, uh, Jenny Yellen even come out and talk about uh, she failed to see some of the realities that came into being in terms of inflation in the US economy. Putting that aside, how do you see the current policies and the thoughts coming from the central government about make sure to avoid further bigger inflation then? Well, uh, inflation in China so far still is not a problem. Uh, in the first four months, average inflation was 1.5%, almost the lowest in the world, and way below China's 3% target. And in April and May, inflation took up a little um, because the disruption in logistics and also the lockdown measures. Um, but in the second half of the year, despite the poor price increase, I can still see a very contained inflation pressure it could exceed 4% at some point, but the overall average inflation this year cannot exceed 3%. Uh, there's a high chance it won't happen. Um, and that means monetary expansion has uh, actually quite a, a, quite a lot of room to expand. Uh, on top of that, the RMB valuation um, is more or less stable now. It depreciated quite a bit, but that means the pressure of depreciation is more or less released. Mm. Bert? Uh, look, I don't think inflation is is the biggest concern of the government at this point, but but looking at Yellen or looking you mean to at the Yellen, Chinese government or to governments as a whole, uh, to to the Chinese government, to to other okay. governments. I mean, in Europe, it's a concern. It's a big supply shock, a lot of energy price inflation. In the U.S., it's a much broader inflation, so there is a concern. Uh, but for the set, for the Chinese government, what 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 I, I do, uh, in the short term it is really demand. Over the medium term, as demand recovers they need to not make the mistake that the United States make is overstimulate the economy. But I don't think that th that is right now the concern. Maybe six months from now, I can reconsider, but right now it's not the concern. Mm. Overstimulating the economy, that seems to be the thing China wants to avoid from the very beginning, even a few years ago when the pandemic started. Now, uh, Chang, your thoughts on inflation? I think inflation right now is a problem for uh, most of the part of the world. Um, basically, according to the textbook and the historic experience, inflation can be very important disruptors for the whole economy. So if Paul Walker ever taught anything of us, that is, you before you do anything else, you need to tame the inflation. So inflation can be a problem. But for China, the situation can be a little bit different. Uh, as my colleagues just mentioned, uh, while inflation is not quite a problem for Chinese government right now, but uh, you do understand that Chinese government do have a habit that to cross the river by filling the stones. So in China, we've been encountering many, many uh, inflation problems uh, or the problems uh, been induced by the inflation. So the Chinese government have uh, good memories about that. So they try to avoid the yeah. situation and protect the people and the uh, purchasing powers uh, by doing that. But also, I think right now we've been kind of on the verge of the deflation. So that is going to be another problem that China have never, uh, you know, run into before. So I do think we need to very balanced policies, try to avoid both of the situation. I mean, just as my coworkers just mentioned, uh, small players in the market, restaurants, small companies, if they quit the market. So we've been seeing the size of the whole economy has just been shrinking. And that will induce a lot of problems like unemployment, uh, the reducing of the tax basis, and et cetera. Yeah. But China never ran into that kind of problem before. So we really need more of the experience from other countries. Well, the significance of the Chinese economy certainly is not just about its internal market. It's, it's also beyond the, in the region and in the world. There have been some talks then about whether there will be enough uh, demand from the world, uh, for example, for the Asia Pacific region, particularly China's and Asian neighbors uh, uh, for uh, economic growth because the Chinese market at this point is still uh, struggling with some of the challenges we mentioned earlier. There's also the issue of whether China will be able to rebound and contribute as much or similar to the global supply chain and global uh, demand uh, at this point. Now, your thoughts. 
Well, this has become an interlinked problem um, because we can't forget that China does have an overcapacity problem in almost all its sectors. And in the last two years, this problem was, was not that prominent because the foreign demand had been so strong. China's export actually contributed more than 50% of GDP growth in 2020 and 2021. It was never like that before. Mm -hmm. And now the economy is going more inward, but domestic demand can't really meet up um, or cover the loss of the foreign demand. And the global economy is slowly into getting into this recessionary mode. And we don't know how long it will last, but for the rest of the year, it doesn't look rosy. So it really depends on how Chinese government can stimulate its domestic demand sufficiently to really digest all those overcapacity in the industries. Yeah. Because now we're trying to encourage everybody to go back to work, but they produce a lot of stuff and not enough people are buying. Bert, that's a very interesting question. You know, what is going to be the Chinese economy's role in the global supply chain and also global demand in the short term, for example, the rest of the year and in the midterm at uh, the next few years? Uh, your thoughts on this? Well, it's a, complica a complicated situation because China also still faces some supply constraints because of the COVID measures. Uh, uh, but it clearly in the first quarter, export hasn't done as well as, as in the past. And, and, and uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, in part also because other countries are coming on stream. So there's more competition for China out there. But also the overall demand is very, very lukewarm, in part because uh, uh, in the United States and in Europe, they're starting to wake up to inflation. There's measures being taken that would basically mean that demand is not going to be very strong compared to last year. In the somewhat longer term, there's a lot of debate on China's role in the world economy. And there's geopolitical concerns. Uh, and then there is uh, indeed concerns uh, by some foreign companies on whether China is still a good base for, for their global supply chain. I think the, the, the second part will, will, will disappear over time. The geopolitical situation is very complex, and there's a lot of companies that now say, well, maybe we should find a, a China plus one strategy. That doesn't mean that, that, that China doesn't play a role in the, in the world economy, but does mean that, that foreign investment for export is going to be less important, whereas foreign investment for the Chinese market is probably going to gain in importance. So you find a different kind of foreign direct investment coming in uh, and some others going up. So you are saying, Bert, if I understand right, that it is ultimately going to be some of the long-term issues like geopolitics that's going to have a huge impact on the realities and near future of China's role in the global supply chain and demand. That's what Correct. you're saying, right? Rather yes. than just uh, what we are seeing short term with the pandemic and relative uh, and related issues. That is that is correct. I think that is the more important fact. Also, I'm, I'm with Dan Wang that you know, China is a very big market and, and a lot will in the future will depend on domestic demand, but the yeah. interaction with the rest of the world will remain important for all kinds of reasons, uh, but it's changing and, and, and geopolitics is the most important driving factor. What about for the region, especially uh, for Asia? You are based in Southeast Asia, in Singapore. Now, there are a lot of discussion internationally about what this region will do. We see some geopolitical moves already. Uh, however, trade is the key word for the region. And uh, how do you see, Bert, um, that uh, economies in the region will be uh, you know, taking the place in the global supply chain if China would not be able to be there. Meanwhile, how much do you see is the possibility that the rest of the global market, for example, Europe, North America, will be make up for the temporary absence of uh, Chinese consumers and tourists in the region? Well, look, regionally, frankly, I think uh it's still quite a bright future. Uh, the region has, is less affected by the geopolitics. It's very clear uh, Premier Li Xianlong uh, has expressed the, the, the wish of many countries. We don't want to choose. We have a great relationship economically with China. And RCEP, the, 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 region, the regional trade deal recently signed, recently coming into effect this year, 
uh, is, is a great example of that. So I see a, a strengthening of those regional integration and regional supply chains. But the same is happening in Europe around sort of the German, with Germany at the center, and then you have the United States and the transatlantic forces that might be a, a bit, become a bit stronger. But for regional integration, I think China will remain very, very central. Of course, it will, it will shed some, some industries that are no longer viable in China. Uh, but and, uh, and Vietnam is already a beneficiary, uh, hopefully Indonesia, uh, other countries that, that are ready to absorb some of that investment. And, and so China will remain very much a very strong regional hub, but increasingly also for the Chinese market. Mm. Chang, your thoughts? Same thing. Well, I think uh, ASEAN regions is especially important for China right now. Uh, China is right now uh, pushing forward the policy of the double circulation. Uh, on one hand, well, in the previous period of time, China really underlined too much of the outside uh, market. Uh, Export-oriented economy can be a, uh, a, a very important trade market in China. But right now, China has been thinking, well, probably we should also put equal stress on the domestic market yeah. consumptions as well. So I think right now, China and ASEAN countries can be a really good complementary to each other. Uh, ASEAN countries, they have a, a very important supply of labor forces and raw materials. And also itself is a booming market. And China itself is the manufacturing economy. And also China is as well a very large economy. So I think there's many, many space for China and ASEAN countries can, can, uh, can actually work together with each other. We've been seeing that yeah. Chinese companies move into uh, Vietnam, to Myanmar. Malaysia and etc. And also been seeing uh, their products have uh, been shipping into China constantly. So I think I think this is really a double win. And uh, plus that uh, we've been seeing uh, the whole region is under the similar uh, culture circle. So people have similar emphases, can have similar background and culture. So I think yeah. this can be a really good story looking uh, into the future. Very nice discussion, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I learned a lot. Uh, things are evolving very fast. I'm sure we're going to get together again on some of the latest development as they get go. So thank you so much, uh, Wang Dan, Chu Chang, last but not least, uh, Bert Hoffman. Really appreciate it. All the best to you and your family. That's a discussion on the latest policies for stimulating the Chinese economy and economic recovery. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.